Today we're throwing it back to the 1800s and we're brewing an English IPA. I'm really excited to be trying out some new craft malts uh, that I've never used before from Admiral Maltings. And we're also gonna be testing out the Anvil XP Brewing Pump, which is a pretty neat little pump. I'm actually very excited to get going today, not only because it's the first brew day in several months that I've done, but also it's the first uh, a beer that I'll be brewing that's above half a percent ABV since this will be ready for the end of dry January. So a longtime channel viewer sent me some freshly malted Admiral Maltings, Maiden Voyage, and Kilnsmith, along with a couple recipes that he has put together for a couple English beers. Uh, he says work really, really well with these malts. The recipe I'm using today is very similar to the one he sent me, but it's not an exact copy. I'm also very excited to be trying out the new Anvil XP Brewing Pump, which is a really cool innovation from Anvil Brewing. It's it's a pump that sits somewhere between the super powerful Blickman Riptide Pump and your average kind of lower power brewing pump um, that is, you know, off the shelf kind of equipment. What's very cool about this pump though is it has many of the same features as the Riptide does, except in a very small package compared to the Riptide. So it should be interesting to see how it performs. I'll be just replacing the standard claw hammer pump with this pump in today's brew. At the end of the year last year, in my year in review video, I said that I was planning on doing more English beers in 2024, and here we are starting off that trend. So English IPA is a pretty interesting one. It's definitely historical beer, but it's also one that still kind of gets brewed a little bit more frequently nowadays. Um, and they're actually really, really good when done well. They are very similar to a standard English pale ale, except bumped up in ABV and in hop bitterness. Despite like really kind of giving rise to the IPA style and being the granddaddy of it all, English IPA doesn't taste really anything like modern IPAs do. Number one, they're using English hops, which is gonna give a very different character to the hop flavor than your standard American hops will. Harkening back to its roots as an English pale ale, English IPA is also significantly maltier than most modern IPAs. You're looking at much more dark of a color, somewhere between orange and brown generally, and also you have really just like a lot of rich, like toasted malts and crystal malts in there to give it some really classic English pale ale character. I'm also really excited because this is a really good beer to put on the beer engine that has been sitting dormant for several months now. So when this beer is fully fermented, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in a keg and I'm going to keg condition it and keg carbonate it with some priming sugar and then I'm gonna stick it on cask, put the cask breather on the keg and we should be good to serve it as if it was a cask ale. So I'm really excited to see how that impacts everything and I think it's just gonna take everything up a notch. So I'm really, really pumped for this beer. Before we jump into the recipe, I wanna give a shout out to a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, uh, besides the malts, which were shipped to me by an individual, uh, you can get all the other ingredients that you need for this batch of beer on their website, so check them out for that. And secondly, Clawhammer Supply, who are manufacturing the system that I'm brewing on today, uh, which is the 10 gallon, 240 volt system. So now for the recipe on this beer, we're gonna start out with 11 pounds of Admiral Malting's Maiden Voyage, which is basically a pale ale malt. Um, the very similar thing to Golden Promise or Maris Otter, so if you can't find Admiral Malts, um, I'd recommend just picking up some Maris Otter. Secondly, we're gonna use three quarters of a pound of Viking Cookie Malt, <laughs> which is a pretty cool toasted malt. I've never used it before, but supposedly does lend the flavor of kind of like baked cookies into the beer. So we'll see how that works. Next, we're gonna add three quarters of a pound of Admiral Malting's Kilnsmith, which is kind of like a lighter caramel malt crossed with a toasted malt. It's very similar to Red X, I believe, in the way that it's made. Um, it should be very, very different than your average English crystal malt or American crystal malt. But speaking of that, we're also adding a little bit of a colored crystal malt in here. So four ounces, quarter pound of uh, basically Baird's English Crystal Malt, uh, which comes in around 111 Lava Bond. That should really add some nice color to the beer, uh, as well as a little bit of sweetness and a boost in the final gravity, uh, so that we still can get a nice amount of that malty touch to it. So for hops, we're kind of playing with fire a little bit here because I'm actually increasing the bitterness to slightly over the uh, threshold for the style. So we're looking at about 65 IBUs overall. I think I'm okay increasing the amount of bitterness and the amount of hops in here because I'm serving this on cask. Typically with a cask ale, you're gonna add more hops anyway to kind of make that hop expression come out more through the process of pouring the cask ale. Um, but also it helps because the oxidation involved in cask beers kind of does fight the bitterness of the hops a little bit. So we'll see how that works out. I'm starting out with an ounce and a quarter of Target as a bittering addition, which would give me about 42 IBUs. And then at 20 minutes, we're gonna add one ounce of East Kent Goldings for about 10 IBUs. 
I follow this up with three quarters of an ounce of target at five minutes for seven IBUs. And then we're gonna do a whirlpool uh, with two ounces of Fuggles and one ounce of East Kent Goldings. We'll do a 20 minute whirlpool at about 180 degrees. This is that modern technique I was talking about earlier. This is something that really extracts a lot of hop flavor and not too much bitterness from the hops uh, and allows that uh, kind of character to shine. And then finally, after primary fermentation is complete after about a week or so, I'm gonna dry hop with two ounces of Fuggles. For the water on this beer, uh, we're gonna be using a pretty intense water profile. English beers really typically are very, very minerally, um, and you're looking at a relatively high sulfate to chloride ratio, uh, which is really gonna help those hops come out brightly, but also increase the bitterness perceived um, and the dryness kind of character of the beer. So the water profile I'm targeting is 159 parts per million of calcium, 20 parts per million of magnesium, 36 parts per million of sodium, 117 parts per million of chloride, 304 parts per million of sulfate, and 87 parts per million of bicarbonate. To get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of uh, reverse osmosis water and adding to that three grams of baking soda, seven grams of calcium chloride, six grams of Epsom salt, and 12 grams of gypsum salt. For the yeast in this one, we're gonna be using Fermentus SO4 for the first time in a very long time, actually. So I'll be pitching two packages of this due to the higher gravity, um, and it should get us a relatively clean, uh, but still decidedly English character at the end of the day. Lastly, for the mash on this beer, we're gonna be doing a single infusion mash at 154 degrees for about an hour, followed by a mash out. So that should get us a little bit higher final gravity, which I think is gonna be important when it comes to balancing out the uh, relatively high bitterness on this beer. Anyway, guys, I'm really excited to get this brew day going. So let's go ahead and cut over to the brew day footage. I started out by adding 8 gallons of reverse osmosis water to my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the mash temperature. As this was going on, I milled out my grain and I also measured out all of my water salts and got those ready to go. I added those in as the strike water was heating up. Once I reached that target mash temperature of 154 Fahrenheit, I dove in with the entire grain bill and stirred it up thoroughly, just being sure to break up any clumps. I recirculated the mash for about 10 minutes before pulling a pH measurement and found a pH of about 5.1, which is a little low, uh, but I'm actually comfortable with it because I will be dry hopping the beer later, and dry hopping the beer obviously raises the pH a little bit, so that was fine with me. Once the mash had rested at 154 for a full hour, I went ahead and raised up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit and left it there for about 15 minutes before pulling out the grain basket and letting that drain for another 15 minutes. As the grain basket was draining, I heated right up to a temperature right below boiling uh, to make sure that I was ready to go for the boil. I removed the grain basket and then I heated up fully to a boil, started my boil timer and added my one and a quarter ounces of target for a bittering hop addition at 60 minutes. I let the boil continue for another 40 minutes before before adding in one ounce of East Kent Goldings at 20 minutes and then waiting another 15 minutes before adding three quarters of an ounce of Target at five minutes as well as a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. Five minutes later, I ended the boil and I cooled the wort down to about 180 degrees for a hop stand. I started a whirlpool and I added in two ounces of Fuggles and one ounce of East Kent Goldings and left them recirculating in the wort for about 20 minutes. Once the whirlpool was complete, I went ahead and started to chill down to my pitching temperature of about 65 degrees. This time of year, my groundwater is nice and cold, so I was able to do this in a single pass. Before pitching my yeast, I pulled a sample for an OG measurement, and I found my OG to actually be only one point short of the target at 1059. Once I had transferred the entirety of my wort into my fermenter, I went ahead and pitched in my two packets of SO4 yeast and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation, fermentation guidelines are actually gonna depend heavily on what kind of yeast strain you're choosing for this beer. I'm choosing SO4, which is the Whitbread strain. Relatively clean, relatively neutral, still got a decent amount of body and uh, a relatively pleasant ester profile when it's fermented at the slightly higher end of the range, but can kick out some diacetyl. So what I'll be doing is fermenting this one at about 65 degrees pretty continuously, and then raising up to 68 at the very end of the fermentation for the dry hop. However, English yeasts are incredibly diverse and incredibly expressive depending on which strain you're choosing. If you ferment the Timothy Taylor strain the same way you might ferment the uh, SO4 strain, then you might be looking at some 
very, very different results. Uh, but there's many, many different ones to choose from. And I would recommend for this particular uh, beer, you choose one that has a nice pleasant ester profile and ferment it slightly closer to the top end of that range. At the hotter end of the spectrum, English yeast will kick out a lot of things like stone fruit, but they can also kick out a lot of diacetyls. It's not a bad idea to incorporate a diacetyl rest into your process as a result, especially considering you're dry hopping the beer and you could be looking at hop creep as well. Really my fermentation guidance is just look at your yeast very carefully and use a yeast strain that you're very familiar with the performance on. Make sure you know what it's gonna taste like before you pitch it and ferment it and always be sure you're pitching at a nice cold temperature and pitching enough yeast for your fermentation to be healthy. This might not be a bad candidate for pressure fermentation, although you will reduce your ester profile when you do that a little bit. One thing that pressure fermentation will help with though is suppressing the massive Krausen that most English yeasts will produce during fermentation. That can get out of control very quickly sometimes and uh, make a mess in the fermentation space if you're not careful. And honestly, Voskvike may not be a bad option uh, as a potential alternative yeast for this beer. Vos produces a really nice orange ester, which can sometimes complement English hops. And lastly, if you want to put this on cask, um, and you want to do it via beer engine like I'm doing, there's a couple things you can do. You can either do what I'll be doing and just naturally carbonate the keg with priming sugar to a relatively low level of carbonation and then serve it on the uh, beer engine that way. Or you can actually take the beer off of the fermenter slightly before it's finished fermenting and add the dry hops to the keg. Um, so that way you kind of get that residual bit of final fermentation in the keg itself to carbonate the keg naturally. And then the dry hops are on top of that which is actually really kind of more authentic cask style uh, production. It is a bit tricky though to get that timing perfect. Uh, so I just rather add a calculated amount of carbonation via the uh, priming sugar into the keg and just naturally carbonate it that way. But the point of it all is that you have a container of beer that is naturally carbonated that you can then serve via beer engine. If you're curious about how to make the cask setup work at home, I have a video on that. So I'll try to pop that up in the corner if you're curious about all that. So just to recap, what I'll be doing is I'll be fermenting this one with SO4, two packets of that at about 65 degrees until the very end of the fermentation where I'll raise it to about 68 degrees. I'll be adding my dry hops after the primary is done five to seven days into the fermentation and letting the dry hops sit on the beer for three to five days before transferring into the keg, naturally carbonating it uh, with a very small amount of priming sugar and then putting it on uh, the beer engine. So it should be really interesting to see how this goes. I'm hoping that it turns out to be a delicious beer. So I'll catch you guys in a few weeks when it's all ready. Fermentation for the beer went really well, really fast overall actually. I saw the final gravity of 1012 at about five days, and then I confirmed it two days later with another reading. At this point, I went ahead and dropped in my two ounces of Fuggles for the dry hop and left them on the beer for about four days before transferring into a keg. Once I transferred into the keg, I added a small amount of priming sugar, enough to get us to about 1.8 volumes of CO2, and left it to actually naturally carbonate over the next two weeks. Once the beer was fully carbonated, I cooled it down to a temperature of about 55 degrees Fahrenheit and put it on cask for the beer engine to pull from. The beer is called Captain on the Quarterdeck and it comes in at about 6.2% ABV and about 65 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it's pouring an orange color. Uh, it has a residual haze that I could not seem to get rid of, unfortunately, uh, but still looks great coming off of the beer engine. I love watching the bubbles roiling through the beer, watching that cascade as it settles, and then that amazing head that comes at the very end of the process. This beer is absolutely a tremendous thing to serve on a beer engine. Despite adding findings to the keg, unfortunately this did not clear up nearly as much as I wanted it to. I think it would have been a lot more appealing uh, in appearance if I was able to get it to be totally clear, but unfortunately sometimes that sort of thing happens.
Those of you dads here know that sometimes this is the only way you can get things done. Hopefully she's not too distracting. She's a lot of fun to hang out with, but uh, there's not really any way to film this uh, segment right now without doing it this way. So um, bear with me, <laughs> but let's go in for aroma. For the aroma in this beer, it's really very strong uh, English hops here for obvious reasons. We dry hop this one pretty heavily um, for what it is, and that really earthy English character comes through very, very nicely. It's like a very satisfying, yes, earthy, but also kind of like a little bit mossy and damp kind of character. It's got like a little bit of a berry to it as well. Um, that might be from the yeast. Not only that, but it also has a pretty significant amount of breadiness and kind of biscuity character coming from those specialty malts as well. But now let's go in for mouthfeel. <laughs> you can't have any. For the mouthfeel in this one, this is significantly affected by serving it on cask. The introduction of those micro bubbles into this beer as it's poured via the beer engine makes an enormous difference for how that mouthfeel comes across. It makes it very smooth and very creamy um, and very satisfying and easy to drink. There's a low level of carbonation in this as well as is standard for these beers. That really helps with that mouthfeel as well. It also has a very dry finish due to that high sulfate to chloride ratio. Um, it certainly makes a big difference in the finish of the beer. All right, so now let's go in for flavor. This beer has a rather peculiar flavor, if I'm being honest. Um, English IPAs have never really been my favorite beer, um, but they're really interesting and they're historical and they're definitely a lot of fun to make still. And even though serving it on cask changes things, the flavor of it is still predominantly very bitter. The recipe I'm using definitely amps the IBUs up quite a bit, um, and I probably shouldn't have gone all the way up to 65. In addition to the earthy descriptors you got from the aroma, there's a very strong orange marmalade character in this particular beer, coming again from the hops and the yeast. This really is a very quintessential British flavor um, that makes for a very interesting beer. Again, not exactly one I think I'd reach for all the time, but definitely a fascinating one to drink and to brew. The uh, malt character in this beer is really, really nice as well. The Admiral malts, I was very impressed by them. They performed well, they taste great. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, the cookie malt, I think, comes through in a really cool way as well. Um, the last English IPA I made, I adjusted for color with some chocolate malt, and it was a little too, like, it had a tinge of roastiness in it. This does not have that. Uh, so that's really nice to see that that worked out well. Uh, and overall, just I'm happy with the color. I'm not happy with the clarity. Unfortunately, the dry hop left a lot more haze in this than I wanted. Um, and that really never has gone away. This beer is about four weeks old now, and it's not gonna get any less hazy, which is fine. It just kind of detracts from the appearance and technically cask is supposed to be clear. There's a little bit of like a sweet biscuit in this as well, uh, which is really, really nice. It really complements the rest of the flavors in the beer and kind of upholds that like sweet um, orange marmalade character a little bit more, uh, which is actually really nice. Now, as far as potential improvements in this beer go, I only have two. The first is I would reduce the bittering addition just simply because it works really well for cask because you do lose some of that bitterness through the cask serving process. But when it comes out of a standard faucet, it is not really all that palatable, I think, for the vast majority of people. So I'd dial that back to maybe about 50 IBUs overall. Secondly, I would not use SO4 to ferment this beer with. There are many, many other better options out there, I think, uh, that give a little bit more expressive character. As I said before, there's a great variety in English yeast that give you a good variety of flavors as well. SO4 is the wit bread strain, um, so I'd recommend maybe go for something a little bit more interesting that might complement these hop flavors a bit better. Maybe the Tim Taylor strain. If you want to get maybe more of that malty beefiness in there, select maybe something like uh, Lalamand Windsor to give you a really nice higher final gravity, a little bit more sugar complexity uh, left over because it is not going to attenuate those complex sugars. Or if you want to take the opposite route, make this thing a little bit drier, make those hops crisper and brighter, go with Nottingham. But overall, if you know what you're getting into, this beer is quite enjoyable. You serve an IPA to people nowadays and they're not gonna think about this, right? So you gotta understand what you're actually drinking. Of the several English IPAs I've made, this is definitely the best one. Um, so I'm very happy about that. And one last note, the Anvil XP. I really actually enjoyed that brewing pump quite a bit. Compared to something like the Clawhammer pump or any other off the shelf brewing pump, it's really not giving you that much of an increase in flow rate or uh, pressure. But what it does give you is the ability to take that pump head off with the tri clamp, 
which just is a game changer for cleaning. It, it's just much, much easier to take that tri-clamp off uh, and clean the inside of the pump in, you know, 30 seconds essentially versus taking all five screws out of a standard pump head and cleaning it that way. That's a lot more laborious. So I'm really happy with this pump and it will become my new standard brewing pump for my system. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful and I hope you learned something. And if you did, please go ahead and hit that like button before you go. It costs you nothing. And also please subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below with your thoughts on the video and your thoughts of brewing English IPAs. What do you think about the calf setup? All those things are uh, absolutely welcome in the comment section. So let me know. I love to talk about these things. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this in my merchandise store as well as plenty of other designs. And uh, you can find that merchandise store down in the description box. I also have a Patreon and my Patreon supporters have been really instrumental in helping support the channel's production quality and improve it year over year. If Patreon's not your thing, I also have channel memberships and there's also the super thanks button, which also helps out quite a bit. I also have an Amazon store, which is linked in the description box where you can find all my recommended homebrewing gear that you can find on Amazon, um, and also my channel production equipment, if you're curious about that stuff. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those links out for some more frequent content updates. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me, a lot of work goes into these videos. It certainly take a bit longer to produce now just because there's a lot more stuff going on in my life that I gotta take care of. Um, but either way, I really appreciate you being here and it means a lot to me that you're still watching. So anyway, this one goes out to you and until the next one, cheers.